<laughs> Is this the last slide that we saw? Or was it, that, was, that was where I stopped, right? Here. There are some notes coming around, but because the last lecture was very, very late, we need to get on with it. Um, so we were discussing operational amplifiers and what we're working towards is an ideal amplifier that you can just buy or plug in and not have to worry about how it's biased inside or um, most of its parameters will be dealt with for you and you can just put a few resistors around it and you've got a nice amplifier that does most of the things that an ideal amplifier does. And we were discussing feedback because we said that we'd need to use feedback to uh, make our ideal amplifier, or nearly ideal amplifier, do what we wanted it to. And I just got to the point where I was saying, well, I had this, uh, well, Acrobat's frozen, but on a couple of slides back, I had this little, there it is, little diagram where I said there's a forward path which has some gain G, and there's a feedback path which has also a gain H, but H is usually less than one and that the amplifier would subtract its two inputs. One would be the signal we were giving it, and one would be this feedback signal. And we have G been really, really big in order that we could throw away some of this extra gain to make our amplifier um, have a set of parameters that we, we find more ideal than it would have otherwise. And we'll talk about how that idealization comes about in a bit. So I got down to V out over V in is approximately 1 over H, provided G is really big. So as long as we can define the feedback properly, uh, we don't have to worry about what G is, as long as it's really big. So that is the symbol for an op amp, and we've, we've got two of the blocks. We've got the subtracting of two inputs, VI plus and VI minus, and we've got some gain G. And we said that we'd like the input resistance to be very high so that no current is drawn into VI plus or VI minus in order that our amplifier won't load whatever is driving it. That's to say, if the source that drove our amplifier had a really high thermal impedance and we drew a small current into our amplifier to make it go, that might drop a big voltage across our large thermal impedance. And we wouldn't want that because then the voltage the amplifier sees would be reduced. Put it on that side, wouldn't you? Thanks very much. Better pass those back. In fact, they might, you might need some over here as well. Um, right then. So, the circuit symbol for an op amp, if you were drawing that circuit diagram, looks like, looks like this. And the, the value of AV is essentially G in disguise. Um, but we don't call it G usually because G is, is generalised. Um, we call it A for gain and V for voltage. And we like a low output resistance as well so that we can drive any load. So if I had, um, I don't know, a 50 ohm transmission line or something, and the output resistance of my op amp was a kilo ohm, most of the voltage that my amplifier was producing would be dropped across its internal resistance. And we wouldn't see much across the 50 ohms. It would be a potential divider, essentially. So if you look at equation 11, um, which is the 1 over H bit, we can see that the, the differential inputs needed to subtract the feedback signal from the signal that we, we want to put in. So we must have some differential input, otherwise <coughs> the amplifier won't work. The amplifiers that we've been looking at with transistors aren't differential input, we only have one input, and the way the feedback is done is a bit more subtle. And I don't really want to discuss it anymore because I don't want to clown what you've already got. So, in the diagram there, there, <coughs> VS plus and VS minus are the power supplies, and usually we don't draw them, we just assume that they're there. Um, everybody knows they're there and we don't talk about it. But you have to have them because just like in the transistor amplifier, if you don't have some DC power supply, VS or VCC or whatever, um, there won't be any voltage range for the signal to move about in. We had a diagram I drew here, and it's in the notes that are going around, of some voltages, VE and VB, and then there's a big space and a sine wave. If you don't have that top to bottom, top to bottom bit, of VS and zero, 
or VS and minus VS, there is no danger of any signals, any oscillation or sine waves or anything like that in between. So we have to have some power supplies. And just as we said for the transistor amplifier, the job of the transistor was to modulate that power supply across the load. That's to say, to change its sort of resistance, if you like, but it, really, it describes a current GMVBE. And that is what's making the sine wave appear across the load and the current that flows is flowing from the power supply. So what we're really doing is we're changing the the DC power supply into, well, we're causing an AC current to flow from the DC power supply. And it's the same for the op amp, only it's, it's all in a little black box. So V plus is the non-inverting input. Don't call it positive, because it isn't. And V minus is the inverting input. And similarly, it's not called minus, because minus will be the power supply bit, and it's non-inverting and inverting, always and forever. Just like um, current is through things and voltages are across things, these have to be non-inverting and inverting. Just like diodes don't have a plus and a minus, they've got an anode and a cathode. So it is with this. You must get it right, otherwise people will think you're stupid. And I know you're not stupid. So, the output VO comes from the, the point of the amplifier, so the, the point of it on the left, and um, you can think about this as being sort of equivalent to the, the link between the collector and the load resistor in a transistor amplifier. Um, and the only thing that's left to say is that AV is the voltage gain, it's equivalent to G. And the output VO is determined by the op amp equation. And what the, op the operation amplifier wants to do is to implement that feedback block, which I had further up the, up the slides. And that's to say we need the difference of the two inputs multiplied by a really big gain. Because that was V out is G, V I, H, V O. Now if you take H, V O to be one of the inputs and just call it V in two, if you like, what we've really got is a rewritten version of, of equation 12 with slightly different terms. So if you want to think about what the operational amplifier is doing, um, if you're looking in Horowitz and Hill or such, there'll be a little picture of an operational amplifier and there'll be a little person inside, probably a stick, a stick person, and there'll be some text that says the stick person wants to keep the two inputs together. That's to say if there's five volts on one, the stick person will attempt to keep five volts on the other by having a really big knob inside the amplifier which adjusts the output voltage, and that, that person will do whatever is necessary to make the two inputs come together. I prefer to look at the equation and think about it rather than we ought to be beyond stick people. Or well, they work up to a point, but the difficulty is when you start to try and include other effects, which if they're not going to become apparent this year, will in the next couple of years, the stick person analogy runs into all sorts of trouble because you need an army of stick people and the the cost of financing that army is vast, so we have to give it up. V out A V V plus minus V minus is the op amp equation and you ought to commit it to memory forever. So that was that was the end of what I had to say about op amps yesterday, and I'm not going to go through the review because we're just going to carry on. And there's my old mate. So there should be another lecture. <coughs> So this is today's business, and um, this is the review of the lecture I just finished. If you weren't here yesterday, we spent quite a lot of time talking about how the feedback works in, in, ampli in transistor amplifiers, um, and it's, it's fairly crucial to understanding how they actually work in a sort of arm-waving way. And that kind of arm-waving conceptual understanding is a lot more important than actually being able to write out all the equations. Obviously, you get marks for writing out equations, but if you don't understand how the circuits actually operate, getting to the equations is very hard, and it's that understanding that you need. Because being able to do maths is fine, but it won't make you an engineer. It'll put you in a math department. So it's the concepts which are, which are key. Um, 
And then I did some examples of a small signal equivalent, or I did an example of a small signal equivalent circuit, and we talked about how the small signal circuit can be used to determine um, parameters of the circuit in terms of the resistors and the transistor parameters. Um, and what I really wanted to get across there was that it isn't just about putting in the numbers and finding out what the gain is. You can ask questions like, what happens if I make R1 really big, which was the example that I gave, and transform circuit 2 into circuit 1 or, or back again. And you can look at the equations and say, well, if this is in the denominator, it becomes really big, it will be the biggest fraction involved here, and that will mean that such and such happens. And you'll be able to say whether that's good or bad. Good is usually the gain is determined by the resistors and things we can control, and bad is usually the gain is out of our hands and controlled by the transistor. Obviously, we want all our circuits to work the same way, irrespective of what devices we put in them. So controlling gain and other parameters with resistors and capacitors is ideal. And that's really what I wanted to, wanted to say there. <coughs> um, and then I talked a bit about op amps just now. So in this lecture, um, we have to do some maths about op amps, but it's not nearly as taxing as what we've already seen for transistors. In the next lecture, which is um, next Tuesday, because it's a public holiday in Britain on Monday, um, next, I will not have any slides, but we'll just do some op amp stuff. <laughs> Um, some examples. So this is the this is the the, uh, the derivation bit, and the examples bit comes next. So what happens if you want an amplifier which has a gain of <coughs> plus two or more? Well, this would be a non-inverting amplifier, and well, yes, plus two is non-inverting because it's, it's plus minus would be inverting. Both of the amplifiers we saw with transistors were inverting, um, and you can work that out from how the signage goes on the, the sine wave that comes out compared to the sine wave that, that goes in, or you can work it out through the phase shift, and you should find there's a phase shift of 180 degrees. But let's imagine we want the output to be in phase with the input. We would draw out an off-hand circuit somewhere like this, and if you've done some electronics or alien physics or whatever, you've probably seen something similar to this maybe. I don't really follow how the syllabuses go, but it used to be in there when I did it. Um, usually we assume that the gain G, which is the, the gain block inside the amplifier, is infinitely big. And you might be thinking, well, that's going to make all the numbers really difficult. But actually, it makes everything a bit easier because we can say a few things about the circuit that makes that infinity disappear. And that's the best thing to do with infinities. AV tends to infinity means that there is total control of the circuit by the feedback. We don't have to worry about what happens inside the op-amp. We just assume it subtracts its inputs from each other and is otherwise perfect. And the result of that infinite gain is that it will force the non-inverting and inverting inputs together completely. They will be the same. In a real op-amp, there will be a slight <coughs> difference because the gain isn't actually infinite, and the op-amp can't drive its inputs completely together. But if we assume the gain is infinite, we'll say they're equal to each other, which means we can write an equation out that says V subscript plus equals V subscript minus. So that's really handy, because it allows us to do some, some easy maths after that. So if we can say V plus is, well I've said approximately equal there, but in truth, it is identical for infinite, but usually we write approximately. So what we need now is to say, well, I've got to have an equation for non-inverting input, an equation for inverting input, and then I can set them equal to each other, because I've got this, this equation of equality between non-inverting and inverting input. So if I was looking at what I'll call V minus, but inverting input secretly, we have the output potentially divided between R2 and R1, and then the middle of that potential divider is connected to the, non the inverting input. So we can write out equation one, which is just V out potentially divided, and non inverting input is, is equal to that. And then we can say, well, if 
V plus equals V minus, non-inverting equals inverting input, then we can say, well, that must mean that V plus is equal to VI because it's on the diagram, and that V plus equals V minus, so that means VI equals V out R1 over R1 plus R2. And if we rejig that into V out over V in, we'll find that it's R1 plus R2 over R1. So there isn't anything more than a potential divider and noting that non-inverting input and inverting input are equal to each other. Thereafter, you sub in V in for V plus and you rejig your equation to give you V out over V in, which is the same measure of gain that we had for our transistor circuits. So, unlike the transistor circuit, we don't have to worry about how the transistors are biased or what's going on inside the op-amp. In fact, there are probably between 10 and 50 or more transistors inside all pre-designed by somebody who's attempting to make the engineer's life easier. And these are quite cheaply bought, you can pick them up for 10p or so, um, and they turn up in everything. Well, almost everything. So this is one configuration of amplifier. There is another configuration of amplifier, which is inverting. So this should give us gains which have minus one or more. So minus one, minus two, or more negatively. And the analysis for this amplifier is slightly different. What we will do instead of worrying about what happens to the voltages is worry about what happens to the currents. We will say that because the amplifier is perfect, its impedance looking into its inputs is infinite. <coughs> And if the impedance looking into the input is infinite, there can be no current flowing in that pathway. Because there is an infinite resistance from here into the ground, or from there to there, if you prefer, because that's gravity. If that's the case, all the current that flows into this node, II, and all the current that flows into this node, IF, must be equal to each other because otherwise there'd be some current created or destroyed, and that isn't allowed. So we can say, well, we can write that out as an equation. So if you prefer to think about it in terms of analysis, what we really did was the first step in a nodal analysis just then. We summed the currents at the inverting input, and summing the currents is just another way of saying start nodal analysis. So we said II plus IF is zero, one thing that people often do wrong here is they'll they'll draw that on that way, and they'll draw that on that way, and then they'll write IF equals II. And what they really mean is IF equals minus II. And they'll do the whole analysis right, and in the end they'll be missing the minus sign. It's by far the most common error. And it's all to do, not to do with the maths, maths will be fine. It's to do with how you drew the arrows on the diagram, and then the first equation you wrote down. I guarantee more than 75% of you, when you do the problem sheet that's associated with this, this set of lectures, will make that as the very first error. It happens all the time. I do it regularly. So II plus IF is, is equal to zero. The reason it must be plus is because they're both flowing into the node. If I had one the other way around, IF flowed towards the output, I'd be able to say, II equals IF. That would be all right. But it's just an algebra thing. So the next thing we'd usually do if we were doing nodal analysis is we'd work out what those currents were in terms of the voltages and the resistances. So if we look at equation six, it's II is V in minus non-inverting in, uh, inverting input divided by R1. So that's the voltage across this resistor divided by the current through it. I'm oh, sorry, the voltage across that resistor divided by the resistance. <coughs> Ohm's law. Mm. Um, similarly, the current through R2 is V out minus V minus upon R2. So we're just doing the voltage across R2 divided by its resistance. And since V plus equals V minus, non-inverting input equals inverting input, and since the non-inverting input is at ground, that means the inverting input must be at ground as well. And you might be thinking, well, in that case, why don't those two currents just flow into the ground and be done with it? 
should happen. In fact, the voltage on this node <coughs> is at ground potential, but it is not the ground. It is virtually the ground. And we call it a virtual Earth. The currents have to sum up and they can't just disappear into the, into the real ground because that's, the circuit isn't really like that. But the effect of the large gain in the forward path of the op amp causes V plus and V minus to come together in terms of their voltage. And since one one's <coughs> the ground, we know the other one must be at the same potential as the ground. But it is not actually the ground, although it has the same value. So we call it virtual ground. So we know that if we now using this new information about V plus equals V minus and equation six, we sub in and we get seven and then we rearrange it to get eight. Um, that's fairly easy, you just cross multiply by seven. Um, I trust you can all manage that. If not, try it on an envelope. It's, it's not difficult, I promise. So this is the gain of our inverting amplifier. And the minus <coughs> sign in, in equation eight is what tells us that it's inverting. It's another way of saying that the output um, voltage signal phase shift will be 180 degrees from the input voltage signal phase. You cannot say the output voltage will be 180 degrees in phase without saying with respect to the input. Otherwise it makes no sense. It's like saying, uh, how tall are you? From where? From the ground. 166 from the ground. From the ground. I could just lift you in the air and go, how tall are you now? Uh, probably not, actually. I'm a bit tiny. Um, so we have to say phase shift with respect to the input. Output phase shift with respect to input, always. I haven't got any biscuits, I'm sorry. So that's what I've said in that, that first point there. So two inverting amplifiers in series would yield a non-inverting amplifier. And that would be fine, it's what's shown in the diagram here. Um, if we made R4, R3, R2 and R1 all the same value, we would have the same overall effect on the signals as the non-inverting amplifier in the, the earlier slide. So one amplifier would invert the signal or shift it by 180 degrees in phase, and then the next amplifier would do the same, a net effect would be 360 degrees of phase shift, which is no phase shift at all. So they're, they're, they're the easy ones. We can do those calculations just by using Ohm's law and looking at the circuit and remembering that V plus equals V minus when AV tends to infinity. What happens if AV isn't finite? Well, occasionally we have to worry about this because real op amps don't have infinite gain. We might want to know as we wanted to know what about the base current in the transistor, we said, oh, we'll ignore the base current, worry about it later, and then we'll go back and see if how big it is and what effect it has. Similarly, we might end up designing an op-amp circuit, we'll do a quick back of the envelope calculation <laughs> to figure out what resistors we need, and then we'll pick an op-amp and look at the data sheet, and the gain on that op-amp will only be a couple of hundred, and we'll think, ooh, seems a bit low, better do some more calculations. <laughs> <coughs> so we can still say, well, this is for the, the non-inverting non uh, amplifier. We can still say that the non-inverting input, I'm sorry, the inverting input, V minus, is V out times R1 over R1 plus R2. That's fine. And we can still say that V plus equals VI. But we can no longer say that V plus equals V minus because the gain of the op-amp is not infinite anymore and there will be a slight difference in voltage between the two inputs. So we have to use the op-amp equation VR, AV, V plus minus, V minus. And we have to substitute in the things we know. 
we know what V minus is, and we know what V plus is, and we know that V out is AV times V plus minus V minus. So the trick here is figure out what the two input voltages are, and then substitute into the op amp equation. Its bulletproof method works every time. So we'll have AV times V in minus V out times the potential division of the output with respect to the inverting input. So we've substituted 9 and 10 into 11. And if you rejig that, you'll end up with 1 over AV plus R1 over R1 plus R2 times V out is equal to V in. And then if you divide through by V in and take everything else over the other side, and obviously you're dividing through in the process, you end up with 1 over 1 over AV plus R1 over R1 plus R2. You really must be able to derive these, they're great exam fodder. If you go back through the exam papers, which I'm sure you all will, this always comes up. Given that I've written this year's exam, this always comes up. I'm not telling you which one might come up, but something comes up somewhere. Um, so if AV tends to infinity, we can. when we, I was talking about small signal models the, yesterday, um, I said, well, we can worry about what happens to R1 if it becomes really big. Well, we can worry about what happens to AV if it becomes really big. We can say, if I've done this calculation, now I know what the effects of AV are, what happens if, if AV really was infinite? Will I get back to the equations that I had before? Well, we can try this one at home as well, but if AV tends to infinity, 1 over AV becomes 0, and you, you find that 13 becomes equation 4 because the 1 over R1 over R1 plus R2 will just flip the denominator upside down and it'll go R1 plus R2 over R... Sorry, R1 over R1 plus R2. So 13 will become 4. The other important things to note are that I've already said this, AB is equivalent to G. Come on dude, I can hear you from here. Um, and it's usually between several thousand and several hundred thousand in, in most op amps, although some op amps you'll find it as low as a couple of hundred. AV is actually frequency dependent. That is to say, at DC, AV will take a certain value, and at a couple of kilohertz, it'll probably be the same value, but by the time you get up to a few hundred kilohertz, it'll be a different value. Now, that's true for transistors as well. Their beta is frequency dependent, and we, we've had that in the lecture quite a while back. I don't propose to worry about the fact that beta is frequency dependent, and I don't propose to worry about the fact that AV is frequency dependent. So there is no frequency dependence in this course at all. There will be eventually in 225 or, or whatever they're calling it now. This will come along, and there'll be some more up and stuff to do with how you make filters and integrators and that sort of thing. So we're not going to worry about that at the moment. So what about the inverting case? We've had the non-inverting case where AV is infinite. We've had the inverting case where AV is infinite. And we've had the non-inverting case where AV is not infinite. So there is at least one more to do. The method is the same as the, the prior, where we said we'll sum the currents at Oh, it's rather high. Somebody come and point to this for me. Um, so we sum the currents at the, the inverting node. Um, and we'll write out equation 14, and we'll do the same thing as substituting the voltages and resistors in for the currents, just applying Ohm's law. And then we'll transpose it, that's to say shuffle the terms, until we get V minus. That's to say the voltage on the inverting input. Now, you might be thinking, hang on, isn't that ground? It's not ground because now the gain is not infinite, we can't say that V plus equals V minus. They're nearly the same, but not quite. So V minus will have a very small value, but it will have a value which isn't zero. So we've got V minus in terms of V in and V out, and we know that V plus really is zero because it's connected to the real ground. So then we plug those two things into the off-amp equation, which is V out is AV, V plus, minus, V minus. And we'll get V plus is zero, minus equation 15 in big square braces. So the trick with these is find out what V plus is, 
find out what V minus is, substitute into the Ockham's equation, rearrange, be happy. Next thing's rearrange, because we need to divide by V in somewhere to get V out over V in from 17 to 18. Oh, I put an extra step in to be kind. So that, that all yields 19 anyway. And we can ask the same question we asked before, which is what happens if AV becomes infinite? <coughs> well, then the 1 over, e, 1 over AV term becomes 0, and we, we've got minus R2 over R1 plus R2 over R1 over R1 plus R2. The, the partial denominators cancel, the R1 plus R2 and the R1 plus R2 both go away to leave minus R2 over R1 which is the same as what I had <coughs> further up the lecture. If you don't believe me, please feel free to try. So we can make frequency dependent amplifiers, that is to say filters, and we just have to use frequency dependent components instead of resistors. So we can use capacitors or in principle you could use inductors. In fact, there are some cool methods you can use with op amps, and I use the word cool advisedly, um, where you can make an inductor look like a capacitor. And you, you can go read about that if you want to. But R1 and R2 can become Z1 and Z2. That is to say some arbitrarily complex impedances that we can, we can just define. So we can make many different kinds of fills, right? I don't really want to talk about them too much, but you also know at least that it can be done. We can also use capacitors judiciously in these sort of circuits to make things that integrate and differentiate the signals that you, you put into them. So if you were integrating a square, you'd get a ramp. Um, and you really would get a ramp out of your circuit. It's um, very useful. It used to be used for things like um, aiming payload delivery systems and that sort of thing, any time you need an integrator. Um, and our pumps are really cheap, so you can put them in the front of something that's going to be destroyed and it doesn't really matter. Although when they used to use that sort of, that sort of thing, our pumps are actually much more expensive. But there are a myriad of uses. Lots of this sort of thing is done with DSPs now, but every now and then, what you really need is a good analog circuit. The situations in which that might arise probably aren't very clear at the moment, but with a bit of experience, you will find that DSPs can't solve everything, and that being good at analog is really quite handy. And certainly get you a nice big paycheck. So let's talk a little bit about the parameters of the op-amp or the op-amp circuit because just like with the transistor I said putting the transistor in the circuit affects how it works and when we discussed feedback in the last lecture I said actually the gain of the transistor doesn't change what's really happening is the input voltage that we're putting in is getting smaller due to the feedback and that's why it's getting smaller the output because the transistor's got the same amount of gain it always had. We need to discuss similar things for op-amps as well and the first thing I want to talk about is input resistance. So the input to the non-inverting circuit, that's to say that circuit there, the input to the non-inverting the input to the non-inverting input, I don't like that. Looking into the non-inverting input, there is nothing except the non-inverting input. And I already said that op-amps should have really high input impedances. So it's no surprise that the input resistance is very, very large. Usually a gigaohm, 
up to 10 to the 12 ohms, possibly even a bit more. Although, if you were building such an amplifier, the surface leakage on the PCB would probably mean that bigger currents would flow from this node than flowed into the amplifier. And you have to use all sorts of cool techniques to make your circuit board look a bit better. Um, the inverting circuit, on the other hand, is slightly different. If we said that AV was infinite and went back to the, the circuit, we've got a voltage driving R1, and then if AV is infinite, the node that connects R1 and R2 at the inverting input is virtually connected to the ground. So V in drives a resistor which is pretty much at ground potential. So the input resistance should be equal to R1. If you don't feel comfortable with it, you will after a few problems from a problem sheet. So essentially I is, is VI over R1 and you work it through like that. <coughs> so this is usually in the order of a couple of kilo ohms. Sensible resistor values for an op amp are in the range of about 100 ohms up to about mm, uh, 10 mega ohms or thereabouts. You can't really go much lower than that because real op amps can't drive lots of current and you can't go much higher than that because you have to have certain biasing currents flowing into your <coughs> op amp inputs because secretly inside the box it's just a load of transistors and they do need to be biased in the same way that we discussed some one transistor amplifiers and we had to worry about how we were going to bias them. So a few kilo ohms is, is typical for input impedance of an inverting amplifier. Now that means if we had say a strain <coughs> gauge, if we were making a load cell for a truck to calculate tax or something, and the strain gauge output impedance was 100 mega ohms, we wouldn't be able to use an amplifier with an input impedance of a few kilo ohms because the, uh, the value of the source resistance would be so high that our amplifier input would see negligible voltage and we wouldn't be able to measure the strain properly. There'd be a potential divider. Are you happy with what I mean by that? Or do you want a diagram? I'll draw you a diagram. I'll risk the board again. Get me this as well. <coughs> I had some sort of. Um... Well, let's just draw it as a, as a source for a bit. This is going to be my my strain gauge, um, and this is its its internal impedance RS, and then this is my up amp amplifier. This will be, uh, I'll call it R in and R in, because that's usual. Let's say this is 100 mega ohms, and this is uh, a kilo ohm. Just for the, tell you what, let's make it 100k, okay, so the number's nice. So this is 10 raised to the 3 less than that. Now I've got V in here, let's, let's say that this was um, a volt, for example, which is a very big value from a strain gauge. <laughs> it's out to get me, I'll tell you. Um, right, it's a very big value from the strain gauge, but let's just, we'll see what happens anyway. So I've got a volt here, but this point is virtually at the ground. So if I was just worried about the input resistance, I could jiggle this circuit about, disconnect that, and just pretend for a moment that that was ground in which case I've got a voltage source and two resistors and the middle of these two resistors is VI so what should be the voltage here for a virtual biscuit because I didn't bring any. <laughs> One millivolt. One millivolt, right okay so if I had, um, that's, that's correct by the way uh, let's say I had, uh, I don't know, a mega ohm there and a kilo ohm there ignoring the, I'll change that to make it right by deleting it. So if I had a millivolt here, what would be my, my output voltage? Well, I've got a mega ohm and a kilo ohm. 
thousand votes. <coughs> thousand votes. One vote. Ten votes. <laughs> come on, come on. One e minus three times one e six over one e three. One vote. Can we agree on a vote? Minus one. Vote. Minus, it is my yeah. All right, it's minus a vote. You're quite right. You should have two biscuits. Um, so we've ended up with minus a volt, but we only had a volt to start with. So this amplifier, despite having a gain of a thousand, has done bugger all. And the reason is we've got this enormous potential divider in the beginning due to the output resistance of the source and the input resistance of the amplifier. So you have to be pretty careful about what kind of amplifier you choose when you're, when you're in a certain application. You have to worry about what's driving your amplifier in the same way that you have to worry about what your amplifier is going to drive. If I put an ohm here, I don't know why I would, but I might. This amplifier wouldn't have a hope if it was a real op amp. Its output impedance, which we'll see in a minute, is going to be about 50 ohms or so, usually, maybe 100 ohms. So there'll be a potential divider at the output as well of 100 to 1. So we'd lose practically everything. We'd be back to 10 millivolts. So it's important to worry about what your amplifier is going to be driven by and what it's going to have to drive. And the driven by bit is input resistance. This is a different theatre. So these boards must talk to each other or something. So input resistance is what the op-amp is being driven by, and output resistance is what's driving the op-amp. But, I'm sorry, input resistance is what the op-amp is driven by, and output resistance is what the op-amp is driving. Let's now talk about a special kind of non-inverting amplifier. This is a non-inverting amplifier without any resistors at all, so it's the easiest possible case. All we've done is connected the inverting input to the output. And we can say that this is the same as R2 is zero and R1 is infinite in this diagram here. Or if you prefer that diagram there, they're the same. So R2 zero, R1 infinity, so inverting input connected to output and nothing between there and the ground. Well, if that's the case, we can write out equation 20 and 21 by substituting into the op-amp equation, which is VR and V minus, V plus minus V minus, VI and VO, because that's what the two inputs will be. One will be VI, the non-inverting input, and the inverting input connected to the output. We'll rejiggle the terms in 20, <coughs> so we we'll have V out is AV, VI minus VO, and we'll rejiggle that to give us 21, which will be AV over 1 plus AV. And if AV is really, really big, that's pretty much 1. We can use this sort of circuit to isolate high impedance sources from low impedance circuits. So if I went back to my strain gauge example and I adjusted my amplifier from inverting, which is what I had it as, to non-inverting, and I used unity gain buffer, which is what this is, I'd end up with one volt out and I'd be really happy. And the reason is the input impedance of this amplifier is very, very large. It's about 10 to the 9 or so ohms. And that's for the same reasons as we go for the, the non-inverting amplifier, because this is just a special case of the non-inverting amplifier. So what about some amplifiers with more than one input? <coughs> Ooh, is it really 10 to 12? Good God! <sighs> Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.